this presentation, uh, I'll be talking to you about changes in Bluetooth 5, uh, challenges that they pose to uh, security researchers, and uh, I'll provide some guidance on examining the security of Bluetooth 5 devices uh, and just developing secure Bluetooth 5 devices. And in, as part of that, I will also discuss uh, previously developed attacks against uh, such Bluetooth devices. So to start, for those who are not too familiar with the uh, different forms of Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth Classic and Bluetooth Low Energy are very distinct protocols. They don't have a very much in common, except for some layers in the middle of the stack, such as the uh, host controller interface and L2CAP, the link layer control and adaptation protocol. Uh, what's similar between the two is that they're both frequency hopping, uh, spread spectrum protocols, and they operate uh, in the unlicensed uh, 2.4 gigahertz band. However, the physical layer is different. They have different modulation schemes, different bit rates, different channel hopping schemes. So the actual way the data is transmitted over the air is different. And uh, also, at higher layers of the stack, of the stack you use different profiles in uh, Bluetooth LE versus uh, Bluetooth Classic. Uh, Classic is most commonly used nowadays for audio streaming as well as uh, uh, hands-free calling in, in uh, automotive applications, uh, whereas uh, most IoT devices uh, make use of uh, Bluetooth LE. Uh, so both the LE and Classic protocols are part of the Bluetooth 5 standards and both are technically maintained. However, in recent years in Bluetooth 4.1, 4.2 and 5, uh, most of the changes have been to the um, low energy side of the specification. And uh, as a result, when you usually when you hear the term Bluetooth 5, it refers to the low energy part of the specification as classic is largely unchanged. So the low energy form of Bluetooth was originally introduced in 2010. And originally it was meant as a low power protocol for devices that do not need to uh, transmit a large amount of data. It divides the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum, the approximately 100 megahertz wide band, uh, into 40 channels, of which channels 0 to 36 are for data, and channels 37, 38, and 39 are for advertising. One thing to note is that the actual sequence of the channels is not as they're numbered. Uh, channel 37 is the lowest frequency channel, then you have data channels, if I remember correctly, 0 to 12. Then in the middle, you have channel 38 for advertising. And then you have channels 13 to 36. And finally, 39 is the highest frequency. Uh, they just grouped the channel numbers based on their usage for convenience in the specification. At upper layers of the stack, uh, communications are built on the uh, GAT protocol, which is a, a generic attribute protocol. And in GAT, uh, a GAT server will define a number of characteristics that a GAT client can read, write to, or also subscribe to notifications on changes. For. Uh, in Bluetooth 4.0 and 4.1, the pairing process was rather weak, and I used a symmetric uh, key exchange for establishing the long-term key, and uh, there have been attacks published against it, which I'll discuss later. In Bluetooth 4.2, uh, there was a new, more secure pairing process based on the elliptive, el elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman key exchange, and uh, this prevented the uh, old attacks that a passive sniffer could do. In Bluetooth 4.2, they also added uh, a feature known as data length extension, which extended the maximum size of a message over the air from 
if I remember, 30 bytes now to uh, the full 255 or 256 bytes. I think it's 255. Uh, so this greatly improved the efficiency and throughput of the protocol. And then in Bluetooth 5, uh, they added a number of new PHY modes, including a 2 megabit PHY. And this uh, 2 megabit PHY, together with data length extension, uh, has greatly increased the throughput of Bluetooth uh, LE compared to what it was when it was originally released. And another reason why people often refer to Bluetooth 5 and omit the words low energy is that it's no longer restricted to low power, low throughput applications. Uh, the throughput of Bluetooth uh, 5, uh, the low energy version, is pretty comparable to Bluetooth Classic now. So you can use it largely for anything. It's the only reason that the classic profiles are used for uh, audio communications is that there is there are a huge number of existing devices that make use of them. And I suppose they did not want to reinvent the wheel. So most of the changes in the Bluetooth 5 spec, as I mentioned earlier, are in the low energy side. And so this presentation will focus on the low energy side of the spec. So one of the headline changes in Bluetooth 5 are the new PHY modes. So one, uh, the two megabit per second mode uh, allows much higher throughput. And uh, there are also uh, two new uh, PHY modes that make use of the same one megabit per second modulation as the original, uh, but they add in uh, forward error correcting codes. So one variant of the code uh, uses eight times as many bits as the amount of data for the maximum redundancy, so that if there are slight corruption uh, of the data over the air as it's transmitted over a long distance, you can recover the original data. And uh, less heavily error corrected version is uses approximately, it uses double the bits, and that's the 500k uh, coded phi. Uh, another significant change is a new channel hopping algorithm. In Bluetooth 4, uh, the channel hopping in low energy was based on a hop increment. So the next channel would be the previous channel number plus the hop increment modulo the number of channels. In the new hopping algorithm introduced in Bluetooth 5, uh, there is a pseudo random number generator that's used to compute the channel hopping sequence. One of the biggest changes in Bluetooth 5 is, the, uh, is a huge number of extensions to advertising. So for those who don't know what advertising is, uh, advertising is the transmission of unsolicited messages on advertising channels that uh, indicate that there are, uh, that, that advice is available or that it has some information to share. Uh, there are also forms of advertising that are uh, direct to a particular target as well as uh, scan responses that can be sent in advertising channels, uh, but the main key of advertising is that advertising does not require uh, the establishment of, of a connection. So what's new in the Bluetooth 5 advertising is that uh, advertisements can be sent on the uh, so-called secondary advertising channels, which are effectively the, the data channels. And uh, by using additional channels, you can transmit far more data without hogging the three primary advertising channels. Uh, there is also a new feature called um, periodic advertising, uh, which allows streaming data to a number of recipients uh, without having to establish a uh, connection. In Bluetooth 5.1, which just came out this year, there were a few more minor additions. Uh, most notable is uh, known as angle of arrival and angle of departure. Uh, so these either look at phase differences between received messages uh, on an array of antennas, or you can have an array of antennas transmitting 
uh, packets over the air, and then the receiving antenna will receive the same message with offset with different phases. And from these phase offsets, um, you can compute the direction in which the um, data came from. So the idea behind this is that it can be used to improve indoor location. Uh, the security impacts of this are fairly low, though I suppose the data could be used for some privacy infringing applications. Uh, the other notable change in Bluetooth 5.1 is that they remove the requirement that all uh, advertisements on the primary channels be sent in order of 36, 37, uh, sorry, 37, 38, and 39. In 5.1, the spec permits randomizing that order. Uh, one thing to note is that all the changes I described above, uh, they are all optional in the Bluetooth 5 specification. So it is possible to make a conformant Bluetooth 5 device that supports none of these new features. And uh, some vendors are doing this just so they can say their device supports Bluetooth 5, even though it doesn't really include any of the new features. Uh, the uh, new Raspberry Pi 4 Bluetooth radios of this nature, it says it supports Bluetooth 5, but it supports hardly any of the new features. So there's been a lot of research against Bluetooth low energy over the years. Uh, one of the most common issues you see is just uh, devices that use unencrypted communications. And if anything sensitive is sent unencrypted or Bluetooth, then you can uh, sniff it and abuse that info. Uh, there have also been attacks against the uh, legacy pairing protocol for introduced in Bluetooth 4.0 and uh, 4.1. Uh, Mike Ryan had published an at uh, attack against this and published a tool called uh, Crackle that can uh, crack the long-term key when the pairing process has been sniffed. Uh, another class of attacks uh, is uh, the discovery and uh, jamming of existing connections. So this was originally demonstrated with uh, the Ubertooth and uh, my friend uh, Damien Koki also demonstrated uh, a similar attack uh, using his uh, Beetlejack utility last year. Uh, another attack uh, Damien demonstrated last year was uh, the hijacking of existing connections. So in Bluetooth Flow Energy, you have a master that established the connection and a slave that was connected to. And what be the hijacking attack done by Beetlejack does is that it jams the response the slave sends to the master, uh, but allows the master's message to go through to the slave. What happens when he does this is that the master device thinks it lost connection with the slave and the master will drop off. But the slave thinks the master is still active because I kept receiving all the messages from the master. When that happens and the master drops off, then the Beetlejack device can impersonate the master and start sending its own messages to the slave. Uh, if the connection is unencrypted, then the, ma then the hijacking master can then send arbitrary messages uh, to the slave and uh, cause it to do whatever the master wants. Uh, apart from these attacks, uh, there have also been a number of uh, software flaws in Bluetooth stacks. Uh, so one of the most high profile in recent years was the uh, uh, so-called uh, Blueborn vulnerability. This uh, affected mainly Bluetooth Classic, but ha there have been bugs found in, in stacks like BlueZ, BlueDroid, or, or Fluoride in uh, recent years affecting uh, low energy as well, both at the uh, L2 cap layer as well as in the uh, attribute protocol, and sometimes in advertisement parsing as well. Uh, and finally, for there are a huge number of devices that make use of Bluetooth low energy, and sometimes they do complex parsing of data sent over uh, GAT. So it's often possible, we've often seen issues of this nature at NCC, uh, of uh, 
vulnerable parsing of data sent over GAT at the application layer. So if you want to build a secure Bluetooth LE device, uh, one thing you should do is uh, require that low energy uh, secure connections are used so that the Diffie-Hellman pairing is enforced and uh, then use it to uh, encrypt and authenticate your communications. Uh, this should be done unless your device has no security significance in what it does. Uh, also, one attack people don't often think of is that uh, on one, Bluetooth pairings are between devices, not between applications. So if you have a mobile phone and you're a product developer and your user on your mobile phone installed your legitimate app and then set up your device to communicate with your legitimate app. If the user also installs unwittingly a malicious app that wishes to communicate with your device, uh, the malicious app would be able to do so since the Bluetooth pairings are available to all devices. So if this is a concern, uh, what you can do is implement an additional layer of encryption and authentication uh, over top of Bluetooth LE using a key that's only available to your own mobile application. Uh, sometimes uh, we've seen many clients uh, just use uh, their own encryption over top of Bluetooth LE and not use Bluetooth's own encryption. And this could be okay if the cryptography is implemented correctly, but that isn't always the case. So you need to be careful with that. And if you want to be safest, you could use both layers of encryption. Uh, another important thing is uh, patching. Uh, every now and then vulnerabilities are found in uh, Bluetooth stacks, both on uh, central devices like mobile phones or computers, uh, as well as on embedded devices. Uh, most of the mainstream uh, Bluetooth stacks have had vulnerabilities found in the past few years, be they in Nordic or TI or any of the other vendors. Uh, so it's important to regularly patch your firmware when vulnerabilities are found in the Bluetooth stack you use. And uh, finally, at the application layer, whenever possible, avoid complex parsing, avoid complicated data structures if you can, uh, particularly if the parsing has to be done on an embedded device in native C code as a uh, We've all seen vulnerable parsers in C, and the less parsing you have to do, the better in general. Uh, and finally, it's good to have a third party perspective on uh, your own devices just to think of new attacks that you may not think of. Uh, it's good to get a third party audit. We at NCC Group do these kind of audits all the time. And it, it's good to examine not only your usage of Bluetooth, but what the overall product does, the architecture of it, communications with the back end, how the, what the mobile application does. Uh, we do all of that. And uh, it, if you're developing a product, it's, it's just a good idea to get some extra eyes on it to look at the security. So, Moving on to challenges that Bluetooth 5 presents to people uh, doing security research or attacks. Uh, the new Phi modes in Bluetooth 5 require hardware support. Uh, existing tooling doesn't support the new Phi modes. Also, the new channel selection algorithm requires software support and sniffers. And also, it makes it more difficult to determine where you are in the hop sequence. Of, uh, in the old hop sequence, where it was just old channel plus hop increment modulo number of channels, it was trivial to figure out what would be the next channel. But in a pseudo random number generator, it's less obvious. One issue that's plagued sniffer since the very beginning of Bluetooth 5 is that uh, connection establishment detection is unreliable if you're listening on only uh, one of the three primary advertising channels. Uh, this is why first, well, sniffing with sniffers like the old TI sniffer or the Adafruit Nordic sniffer 
or, or Beetlejack or most of those that are on the market has been frustrating because uh, these sniffers only support being a one channel at a time. Uh, there are some high-end sniffers like the Elasis ones uh, that do support sniffing all three channels simultaneously using software-defined radio. However, those are extremely expensive, costing tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, this is further complicated in Bluetooth 5 uh, by the advertising extension. So with auxiliary advertisements in Bluetooth 5, it's now possible to establish connections on the auxiliary channels, which are the data channels. And uh, because of this, uh, you have to have a, a channel hopping sniffer to be able to capture these connection establishments on the data channels. So to solve these issues, um, first with the new fly modes, the answer is just using newer, more capable hardware. Uh, among Bluetooth microcontrollers, uh, the most popular brands are, are Texas Instruments and Nordic. So the new TI CC13X2 line and CC26X2 line uh, both fully support all the new PHY modes in Bluetooth 5. Also, the Nordic NRF52840 supports the new PHY modes. Uh, one thing to note is the uh, NRF52832, which is a cheaper variant and also calls itself a Bluetooth 5 device, which is technically true. Uh, the lower models of Nordic, like the 832, do not support the new PHY mode. So if you were to use Nordic, you would have to use the top of the line uh, 52840, whereas for TI, older Bluetooth 5 products support the new PHY modes. So Sniffle, which is my Bluetooth sniffer that I'll be introducing next month at hardware.io, uh, uses any of the TI microcontrollers listed above to uh, do sniffing on any of the Bluetooth 5 PHY modes. And uh, Sniffle can be run on uh, low cost uh, TI launchpad boards that are about 40 US dollars. Uh, for dealing with the new channel selection algorithm, uh, I implemented it in Sniffle and Sniffle can automatically detect uh, which channel hopping algorithm will be used depending on the relevant bits in the uh, advertisement headers. Uh, but one other challenge that it, the algorithm presents is because it's pseudo-random, uh, it's not obvious where you are in the hopping sequence. That made uh, jamming or connection hijacking uh, more difficult. So to deal with this, uh, Damien Koki presented an approach at uh, DEF CON last week. And uh, it relies on the fact that the hopping sequence generation uses the uh, access address of the connection uh, to seed the RNG. And then it has a uh, 60, uh, a 16 bit counter that is the input to the RNG. And uh, as a result of this, the hop sequence repeats after uh, 65, 536 hops. So, what Damien demoed last year was an approach, well, last week was an approach to just capture a bunch of measurements of timing between channel hops. So, just pick one channel, hop to another channel, and then hop to another channel and see how long it takes to receive a packet from one to the other. Repeat such measurements a bunch of times, and then by the process of elimination, figure out where in the hop sequence you are. And uh, he implemented this approach in his Beetlejack 2 tool released last week and uh, used it to uh, jam and hijack Bluetooth 5 connections uh, that are using the one megabit phi since uh, uh, his well, Beetlejack still operates on the old Nordic NRF51 hardware that does not support the new phi modes. For dealing with the difficulty in connection establishment detection, uh, Sniffle hops along with channel, uh, along with advertisers so that it can detect connection establishment in any of the three primary advertising channels. And uh, that makes it uh, nearly three times more reliable at connection detection than 
ordinary sniffers like the uh, Adafruit sniffer or the uh, Ubertooth. Uh, but sniffle connection detection reliability has gone from less than 30% in these sniffers to about 90%. So that makes sniffing much less frustrating. Uh, the alternative to a channel hopping sniffer is just using three sniffers, one in each of the primary advertising channels. Uh, but this still doesn't address um, connection establishment on the uh, auxiliary advertising channels that is possible in Bluetooth 5. So if you want to capture these connection establishments on Bluetooth 5, your sniffer has to do channel hopping. Now one complicating factor is that in Bluetooth 5, since it permits randomizing the sequence in which advertising is done, uh, this makes predicting the hopping sequence of an advertiser um, possibly impossible depending on how it's implemented. Uh, there are no Bluetooth 5.1 devices on the market currently and I don't know what vendors will do. Uh, the randomization is optional so I don't know if anyone will actually randomize the order in which advertising is done but when that happens in the future we can deal with it or as a worst case scenario, we could have three sniffers and but then also do channel hopping for the auxiliary channels. So supporting these new auxiliary advertising channels is also a little bit challenging because it requires uh, complex uh, channel hopping scheduling. Uh, uh, an advertiser doesn't just stay on the three primary channels or just the auxiliary channels. Advertisers will be transmitting advertisements on the primary channels, and then that'll be interleaved between advertisements in various channels on the auxiliary channels. So because of this, the precise timing needed and the complex scheduling, it's non-trivial to implement. I have not encountered any real devices that make use of these extended auxiliary advertising features in Bluetooth 5. However, these such devices will probably come into existence over the next year or two. Uh, so I'm working on implementing support for this in Sniffle. Uh, I may or may not have it ready for hardware.io next month, but it should hopefully be in Sniffle not too long. So for those who want to do some research on Bluetooth 5 or Bluetooth 5 devices, um, to capture communications, uh, HCI logging is the most reliable and convenient approach where it's available. Uh, this guarantees you'll capture everything. There's no risk of missing connections. Uh, however, when you're looking at HCI logs, um, be aware that uh, the Bluetooth controller does some transformations such as encryption of the data that will not be seen in the HCI logs. Uh, you will see configuration updates of the uh, controller that give it keys and tell it to enable encryption, uh, but the actual encrypted data you may not see in the HCI logs unless there's, apart from an additional application layer encryption. Uh, also, uh, if you're dealing with uh, a buggy Bluetooth controller or just trying to troubleshoot a Bluetooth stack, uh, the most reliable way to see what actually goes over the air is to use a sniffer. So if you want to be sure that what's ha going over the air is what you're seeing, you should use a sniffer like Sniffle. Also, if you're dealing with devices where you don't have the ability to pull HCI logs, then sniffers are your only option. And uh, Sniffle makes sniffing a lot less frustrating. Uh, one class of vulnerabilities that are under-researched are bugs in Bluetooth controllers. Um, it would be very interesting to attack a Bluetooth controller both from the HCI side and the over-the-air side, and then use that to hide malware, for example. Uh, this type of research can be a bit challenging because uh, most Bluetooth controller firmware is proprietary and require quite a bit of reverse engineering. Uh, for finding bugs in Bluetooth stacks, uh, fuzzing and code review has been effective for years and uh, uh, new bugs are likely to continue to be found. Uh, 
particularly as these stacks keep changing, new features keep getting added to them. Uh, BlueZ and Fluoride on Linux and Android uh, have undergone a lot of scrutiny. Uh, that doesn't mean there's still no bugs in them, but they've at least had a lot of attention from researchers. There are also a lot of uh, under-scrutinized stacks, uh, mainly those on uh, embedded devices, be the, the stacks of Tia and Nordic and Toshiba and, and brands like that, uh, as well as uh, stacks used, say, by automotive vendors. Uh, these haven't had enough research, so there's a uh, high chance of there being bugs in them. And some bugs have been found in them, but more research will probably find more. Uh, when you're looking at Bluetooth devices, you'll find that a huge number of devices uh, just use no encryption at all. And to decide whether or not that's an issue, you need to consider the threat model of the device. When you have an encrypted link, the device is vulnerable to impersonation. It's also possible to hijack connections and modify data sent to the devices. So you need to think about what risks these pose to the target to decide if encryption is necessary. Um, custom crypto protocols implemented over PLE uh, commonly have issues. We've seen many of these. Uh, when you encounter a custom crypto implementation, always be wary and uh, also be careful if you're implementing your own. Uh, it's also common to see uh, insecure firmware OTA mechanisms uh, used in Bluetooth low energy. Often these OTA mechanisms we've seen uh, have no signature verification for the firmware at all. So anyone could transmit malicious firmware to a BLE device. Uh, over the air and take control of it, which is obviously quite bad. Uh, we've also seen uh, unsafe parsing of uh, gap characteristic values at the application layer, as well as in safe, unsafe parsing of advertisement data and scan responses. So uh, be careful with parsers and uh, fuzzing can also be a, a, a good approach to find bugs in Bluetooth devices when you don't have code available. So, uh, are there any questions?